uh, get into the Word of God today. We're in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7. So if you'd like to turn there with me, you can turn there with me, Romans chapter 7. Years and years ago, I was more of a, uh, I, I took the approach of teaching and preaching, of giving just a few verses of Scripture and telling lots of stories and things like that. And then the Lord changed me and I found myself, you know, doing more verse by verse teaching and here recently, just nothing but verse by verse, verse by verse. I told a, a minister that, that that's one of the professors at the Emmaus Bible College, and he said, Steve, actually, verse by verse teaching is called expositional teaching. That is the greatest way to teach the Word of God. And the reason for that is, is because it restrains the preacher from trying to or allowing himself to put his thoughts into those passages because the passages interpret themselves. One verse interprets another verse. And so we're really keen here at our church to, to be mindful of the context that the passages are sitting in and just to leave them sit there and uh, not to try to extract our ideas from that, but allow God's thoughts and his wisdom proceed from that. <coughs> We're in the book of Romans, like I said in chapter 7. We're studying Romans because we believe Romans is the ABCs of the Christian faith. If you want to be rock solid in your Christian faith, then you need to understand the ABCs of the Christian faith, and you find that in the book of Romans. He is saying that that, that principle of sin that is in our body uses the law to its own advantage to stir up passions. And he's going to talk about that now in the next few verses. And so he wants to make clear here, don't say anything negative about the law. The law is beautiful. The law is precious. In verse 12, he's going to say it's holy, just, and good. The law is wonderful. Just because it doesn't justify you, just because it doesn't sanctify you, doesn't mean it's, it's not wonderful. Now, a lot of people have a wrong view of God's law. You bring up God's law, and immediately they'll say, well, this pastor must be a legalistic pastor. This must be a legalistic church. They, they feel like the law, you know, has some worth. Listen, if the law is holy, just, and good, it has a lot of worth. It just is, but we are not to use the law to justify or to sanctify ourselves because that's not the purpose of the law. The law was never designed for that purpose. If you use the law for the wrong purpose, for which it was not designed for, then you'll become a legalist. You'll try to justify yourself by your performance. You'll try to sanctify yourself by your performance. You'll try to adhere to certain things. And if you did, then you're considered to be righteous and holy. If you fail, you're considered to be sin sinful and lost. Okay. Until God, by His Spirit, begins to apply the spiritual character of the law to their heart to expose sin for what it really is. And until sin is exposed for what it really is, everybody is fine with sin. The psychologist do not want the preacher to bring up the word sin. The psychologist doesn't want the preacher to bring up the word repentance. They are preachers today that will glory in the fact that they never say the R word. The R word is the repentance word. Can't say that word because it makes people feel uncomfortable. You can't talk about sin because sin, talking about sin is being a medieval preacher. And it doesn't do anything for our dignity. It doesn't build us up, lift us up, make us feel like we can take on the world. We should never talk about sin. You should never refer to a person as a sinner. No, no, no. It's up, up with people. And that's, that's the mentality, I'm being honest with you, that's the mentality. If you turn with me, hold your place right here in your Bible, and turn with me to Luke chapter 13, I want you to see something. Do you think if Jesus, Jesus mentioned the word sinner, he would be wrong, he'd be evil, he'd be ungodly, he'd be uncouth? There are people that think that it's very, very wrong for you to refer to sin or sinner. It's not positive. It doesn't make people feel happy. 
But the reason why the law exposes sin is because sin is everybody's troublemaker. And until it's exposed and seen for what it is, nobody knows that they need a Savior. Have you ever tried to talk to people about Jesus and they just kind of fluff you off like, you know, no big deal. Hey, take it easy. I'll be fine. Well, what's happening there? They have no consciousness of sin. None whatsoever. Now look at Jesus in Luke chapter 13. And look what happened here. He says in verse 1, there were present at the season some who told him about Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now that's a terrible thing, isn't it? And the people are talking about this terrible thing that Pilate did. Evidently somebody was offering sacrifices. I don't know exactly the, the situation here. I don't know if it was Jewish people offering sacrifices. I don't know that for sure. I don't know what it was. We kind of tend to believe that maybe that it was that. Pilate was upset with them for whatever reason, and he mingled their blood. He killed them and mingled their blood with their sacrifice to desecrate their sacrifice. That's what he did. Now, the people, when they seen this terrible thing or heard about this terrible thing that happened, they're saying, wow, those people that Pilate did that to, they must have been terrible sinners for God to allow that to happen. And so Jesus, in verse 2, answered and said to them, Do you suppose these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? And that's what Jesus said. He says, Do you believe that these Galileans were worse sinners? Jesus used the word sinners. Jesus didn't know what the psychologists taught. They didn't know what the preachers are saying today. You shouldn't say that. That's wrong. Jesus is confused. He's all mixed up. No wonder he... You know, he's not going to get anybody saved that way. You can't talk to people about their sin. You can't talk about people could be sinners because that's not positive. Jesus is positive. Jesus wants you happy. Jesus wants you to know there's a troublemaker and that he's the troublemaker's solver if you turn your back to your troublemaker and come to Jesus. Okay? Then he goes on to say in verse 3, I tell you the truth, unless you repent, you all likewise perish. In other words, you think these people are, are, are terrible sinners. He says, I'm telling you that this never happened to these of, those of you that think you're keeping the law. And see, this is the problem with the Pharisee and the Jewish person. They knew the law only as a means to justify themselves. If the law said, don't do this, it said, I won't do that. I won't do that, I won't do that, I won't do that, I won't do that. Okay, I don't do any of those things, I'm going to heaven. They had no concept of their sin because they thought that the law only talked about outward actions. They never knew that the law addressed the heart. They didn't know that. They had to be blessed by God for that to come to their heart, for them to see their sinfulness, so they could see their need for a Savior. Okay, and so Jesus is saying, wait a second, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. You know, he said repent. He said the R word. Now, you're not supposed to say the R word. I'm telling you the truth. This is what they're telling me. I was with a pastor this week. He came to me and he says, Steve, do you know that you know, the largest church down in Houston, Texas, the pastor set up, stood up and said, I'll never say the R word in this church. I won't say the R word in this church because it doesn't build up people. Doesn't build you up. Jesus said the yard word. What is the matter with Jesus? He said the R word. He said the S word. Sin, sinner, repent. Jesus even said the hell word. He said it. He said it. He, he talked about hell more than any preacher in the Bible. What is Jesus doing this for? Doesn't he know he's going to offend people? Doesn't he know he could lose his crowd? Look what he goes on to say. Jesus doesn't just say it once. He says it twice. He says, or do you, he goes in verse 4, he says, or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners? There he goes again. He says it again. 
than all those men who dwell in Jerusalem. So in other words, there's a tower that fell on, on some Jews. Everybody's thinking, oh, they did something terrible. God killed them. And Jesus said, do you think they're worse than all the other people in Jerusalem? He said, all oh, worse sinners? He didn't say uh, uh, that, they, that they are worse sinners than all other men. In other words, he called all other men sinners. You mean Jesus calls all people everywhere sinners? Why did Jesus come? The Bible says, for this reason Christ came, to give his life for sinners. That's what the Bible says. He did give his life for people that had just pro little problems and issues and mistakes uh, in their life. He came to die for sinners. He says, let, let, let I tell you, verse 5, but unless you repent, he did it again. He did it again. He said the word repent. <sighs> Jesus didn't know what the patriot down in Houston, Texas knew. They got greater revelation nowadays than Jesus. You, you'll repent unless you likewise perish. <gasps> he said the P word, perish. That's talking about hell. Shouldn't be talking about those things. Now, see how foolish all that is? Go back to Romans chapter 7. Do you think God would put these things in the Bible to hurt us or to help us? Is the word of God sent to hurt you or to help you? Now, am I marching around in this church pointing my finger at everybody? You dirty, rotten sinner. You better repent or you're going to hell. Am I saying that to anybody? No. no. We're just teaching and preaching the word of God. We're bringing out what Apostle Paul happened to say about the law. That God's law was not designed to justify you or sanctify you. It was designed to show you that there is a problem. A problem that you don't know about and a problem you probably don't want to know about. And the reason why the law is exposing this problem is so you will want to go to the doctor, the great physician, and be healed of it. Now, hold your place in Romans and let's go over here to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Let's go over here and take a peek at this. Galatians chapter 3. Now it says in verse 22, but the scripture has confined all under sin. In other words, all men are under the dominion of sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ may be given to those who believe. In other words, all are under sin. No one can get out from underneath sin by, by, by their performance. They're under the dominion of sin. They have to be released from the slave master. And they're released through faith in Jesus Christ. That the promise is by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was someone that hated us. Is that what it says? Therefore, the law couldn't stand us and wanted to kill us, send us to hell. Is that what it says? What does it say? It says, therefore, the law was our tutor or our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Is that a bad thing or a good thing? What do you think, everybody? What do you think? It's a bad thing to come to Christ. Never talk about the L word. The L word. The law. Because if you talk about the law, you're a medieval preacher. Mead evil. You know. Back in the 14th, 15th, 16th century. But they say you're a me, medieval, evil preacher. Because you said the L word. Don't say the L word. But here, Apostle Paul talks about the L word. The great Apostle Paul wrote nearly three-thirds of, three-quarters of the New Testament epistles. He says, therefore, the law was our tutor, our schoolmaster our helper to bring us to Christ. Now, how many people think it's a good thing to come to Christ? How many people think it's a good thing for other people to come to Christ? So if that's a good thing, would it be a bad thing if 
people have taught the law the way it's supposed to be taught. Can't be a bad thing. Has to be a good thing. Now, what happens if nobody wants to talk about the law? Because if you talk about the law, what happens? You bring up the S word. Sin. Oh, no. What happens when you bring up the sin word? The S word, sin. You got to bring up the R word. The S word. The L word leads to the S word. The S word leads to the R word. But the R word leads you to the C word, Christ. You know, isn't the church confused, everybody? What in the world is everybody so confused about? Just confused. Now, my contention is this. If you and I do not understand the purpose of the law, and if we don't know how to properly present the law, we really don't know how to properly present the gospel. Because you cannot separate the gospel from the law. Now, how do you know that? You're still in Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to have to stop right here because we're running out of time. There's a whole lot to talk about. But I want to show you in, you're in Galatians, right? Look at chapter 4. Look at verse 4 and 5. If you don't understand the law, if you don't preach the law, you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand Christ. You don't understand it. So here it comes. You ready for it? But when the fullness of time came, had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born of the law. So let's look at this. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Born of a woman, that reminds us of Christmas morning, doesn't it? Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Remember that? But he also was born under the law. Now, what in the world was he doing being born under the law? Why was he born under the law? Why could he just not be born, un born of a woman? He had to be born under the law. Why? Why was he born under the law? Because you and I were under the law. And we were under the condemnation of the law. We had broken the law. We were sinners because we broke the law. We were transgressors of God's law. God's law represents his holy and just character. When you make light of his law, you make light of his just, righteous, and holy character. You, you, if you make light of sin, you make light of God. If you make light of sin, light of transgressions, you make light of the one who was born under the law to redeem you from under the law. Amen. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Jesus was born under the law. Go to the next verse. Scott. To redeem those who were under the law. He had to get under the law to get you out from underneath the law. He had to be under the law to get you out from underneath the law. Now, he put himself under the law by subjecting himself to it. He wasn't under the law like you and I were. You and I were under the law because we have transgressed God. He just submitted himself to the law in active <laughs> obedience. He did this that we might receive the adoption as sons. In other words, he did this so we would become his children. Okay? So what does it mean that Jesus was born under the law? It means this. When Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, he came out of his, her womb, completely sinless he lived his life as a little child as a young child as a teenager as a, a young adult and as adult and he never transgressed the law one time perfect sinless now why did he do that he did it representing you and representing me if he did do that representing you and representing me, he couldn't die on the cross representing you and me. He had to be your law keeper. Amen. He had to become your law keeper. When God looked down at Jesus, he seen you keeping the law in Jesus. That was Jesus' righteousness that he wanted to give to you as a free gift. But he just couldn't give it to you as a free gift until he dealt with the troublemaker sin. So when he went to the cross, there he was under the just, 
holy, righteous condemnation of the law. God's wrath was poured out upon him. The scripture says he was a propitiatory sacrifice, meaning that he would satisfy the wrath of God. He would turn aside the wrath of God as God would see your sins perfectly punished, perfectly atoned in the sacrifice of the Savior. That's why he was born under the law, that he might redeem you that were under the law. So, if that's true, we know it's to be true. If we don't talk about the law, you really can't talk about him that was born under the law. You can't really talk about him that went to the cross to satisfy the law. So when you talk to somebody about, you know, would you like to come to Jesus? Well, why should I come to Jesus? Well, because you got problems. Well, because your dog died last week, didn't it? Uh, you lost your job. You sure need Jesus. Well, didn't you find out that you're sick? Well, I think you really need Jesus because you're sick. Well, someone told me the other day that you fell down and you cracked your knee. You really need Jesus. You see, this is how it goes. Well, yeah, I probably do need Jesus. Well, you believe in him, don't you? Well, yeah, I believe in him. Who is he? Well, didn't he come and die for us? Yeah, he did. You believe that? Yeah. You believe God raised him dead? Yeah. Well, say this prayer with me. Why? Well, then you receive Jesus. Everything will be fine. Live happily ever after. So you say a prayer. You're saved. I am? Yeah, you're saved. How do I know? Because you said that. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know I was saved. You say I am? Yeah, my preacher says you are if you said that prayer. Really? Yeah, come to my church. Well, I'll tell you that you're saved. So you come to church and everybody tells you that you're saved. So what happens? In Sunday school class, worship service, everybody gets out their paintbrush and they put it into the Christian bucket of paint. And they paint you up so you look like a Christian, so you sound like a Christian, so you kind of start feeling like a Christian. And they just paint you up, and you're all painted up on the outside, but you don't got anything on the inside. That's what happens. All this time, you've never seen the tragedy of your sin. You've never seen the horror of your sin. You've never seen your sin as a transgression against the one who loves you the most, who gave you everything you have. You, you, you see no reason why you need to be reconciled to God. You don't see yourself as one who is an enemy of God. The Bible says that when we were enemies, that Christ died for us. you never seen yourself as an enemy of God. Because all you had was your knee got sore. And your cat died. And, <laughs> you know. And so how could I be an enemy of God if I came to Jesus for those reasons? But what would happen if the Holy Ghost got a hold of you? Like he got a hold of the Apostle Paul. And when he got a hold of you, the Holy Ghost is not afraid of the S word, the R word, the L word. And all of a sudden he starts applying the L word to your heart. And showing you what the S word really is all about. And then all of a sudden you say, oh my goodness, I need the R word. I need to repent. So I can come to the C word, Christ. Do you got that everybody? You see how you have to see that? You have to make it plain, right? Go back to Romans chapter 7 and we'll go home. Romans chapter 7. Am I making it real plain and simple so everybody can understand it? Okay, here we are. What shall we say then? Verse 7. Is the law sin? What do you think? So far we talked about the law. you think it's sin? I don't believe so. Certainly not, Paul says. On the contrary, I would not have known sin. Except through the law. In other words, you know what he's saying? On the contrary, I would have never known sin. I would have never been so blessed to know about my sin. Right. You mean tell me for you to find out about your sin is a blessing from God? Yes. Because there's people all over this world that don't know anything about their sin. And they're not blessed. You're only blessed when you see your sin as a sin against God. When you see yourself living for yourself rather than living for God, that's a sin. When you see yourself cursing or taking light the name of our Lord, that's a sin. When you see yourself committing sexual activity outside of the marriage bed where it's found to be honorable before God, then that's sin. When you see yourself taking things that don't belong to you, when you see yourself belining someone's good character or reputation, that is sin. 
and see. So I can talk about it all day, and it won't do you much good. I will talk about it. But when I talk about it, we need God to talk to you about it. Because when God talks to you about it, you'll listen to him where you won't listen to a preacher. Because a preacher can't get you saved, but the God who speaks to you through a preacher can get you saved. Because that's where salvation is, is in God. Do you see that? He says, I would have, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. Do you see the essence of what he's saying here? In other words, there's a blessing. I found out about sin because of the law. I was blind to my sin. But the law opened my eyes. Opened my eyes. The law opened my eyes. Now hold yourself place right here. Hold, hold it right here. Got it? Now go to Acts. Chapter 26. See if I got it right. I hope I got it right. If I don't have it right, we'll get it right. Acts 26. Do you think it's a good idea to have your eyes open? What do you think? Wouldn't you like to see all your family members and all your neighbors and all the people you went to school with, all the people you used to work with? Wouldn't you like to see their eyes get open and see the troublemaker? And go, oh no, I need help. I need a savior. Wouldn't you like to have that happen? Look what Jesus said to the Apostle Paul. He said in verse 14, he says, uh, Acts 26, he says, When we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Verse 15, so I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Sounds like somebody's eyes are getting opened here. We're going to talk about this a whole lot more later. We're just touching it here. I got another verse to go to. Verse 16 says, But arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister, a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which, you're, which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you, to do what in verse 18? To open their eyes. To open their eyes. Well, when you read behind the Apostle Paul, the way he opens up people's eyes is he uses the L word. He does. He uses the L word. He even uses the S word. And when you, are you still here in Acts chapter 26? I want to have you turn one more page to verse chapter 17. Before you do, look what it says here. Open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. Turn from darkness to light. Is that a good thing to get turned to light? To be turned from the power of Satan. Is that a good thing? To the power of God. Is that a good thing? That they might receive the forgiveness of sins. Is that a good thing? And an inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith in me. Is that a good thing? It all begins with your eyes being opened. Come back next Sunday because I want to show you more about this, about our eyes being opened. You've got to see this. Now, watch the Apostle Paul. Remember, the Lord told him to go open up eyes. And watch this over here in Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. I want you to see this. He uses the R word. Should we use the R word? I wonder if we should. He says, he says, you have me and others with me as a pattern. Walk in my steps. Follow me as I follow the Lord. So the Lord used the R word. We should use the R word. Paul used the R word, right? Look what he says. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to the R word. Oh my goodness. The R word. It's all over the Bible. But see, it doesn't make people feel good. People want to be up, up with people. People need to feel dignified. Psychologist says, don't talk about the R word. Don't talk about sin. It makes people feel funny. <laughs> I'm telling you, everybody. It's foolishness neck deep. That's all I can tell you. That's really what it is.